You're going to hear a couple of consistent themes today, and one is we're really glad you're here. And what we want to do is find a bunch of different ways to help you develop successful careers here for the long term. And this quote is about science, but I think it fits for every field. A career in science should be an adventure on a long and winding path rather than an uphill slog to a peak that few have ever attained. Science is about interacting with and discovering the world. So isn't it a shame that so many of us are persuaded to walk the same narrow and well-trodden path to perceived academic success? And I think you can apply this regardless of your home department. A lot of what we're going to talk about today is the fact that you now own your career and you've got an opportunity to really think about what you want it to look like. And we're going to uh, talk about that a couple of different ways. But, um, and first we're going to have some remarks and you're going to get an opportunity to ask questions of our new provost. Uh, then Tina is going to talk a little bit about post-tenure letdown. Um, and then Senior Vice Provost Barbara Rodriguez and I are going to talk about new opportunities and expectations. And uh, Mary Jo Daniel, Director of Faculty Research Development Office, is going to talk about different ways you can think about advancing your research and scholarship. And then we'll close up. I would like you all to note you should all have a copy of this page. You've got an opportunity through this to request follow-up meetings, ask questions, make suggestions for other workshops. So please do this. If you, you know, don't get a chance to do it, you can also email me or email advance at uh, unm.edu and we can schedule meetings, answer questions. And if you really, really want to be anonymous, you can request confidential meetings through our website or you can even ask questions completely anonymously through what we call our MetaMentor. So there's a lot of ways um, to follow up on this meeting. And now I'd like to introduce our new provost, James Holloway. He's also a professor of nuclear engineering. He's been here since July 1, so he knows all about UNM <laughs> and is going to be ready to take your questions. So um, thanks, Julianne. It's actually kind of intimidating that that picture is going to be behind me for the next 10 minutes or so. Here, we can um, put it up in the agenda. <laughs> that is so much better. I, I actually thought we were going to do Henry the Fourth Part Two, and instead we're doing Q and A. Um, so first, um, welcome and congratulations. Uh, it's worth just taking that moment and, and thinking to yourselves and for us to, to uh, join you in this of just this moment of wow. I mean, seriously, you done amazing work to get where you are through your through your terminal degrees through your doctorates and then through your time as an assistant professor um, you did great work you did great work in scholarship and research you did great work in teaching our students you did great work in service to your disciplines to the institution um, to the wider state of New Mexico and now this is a moment of transition and moments of transition are a great time to stop and take a breath and reflect and be happy, enjoy it, right? I mean, there's, there's a career going forward that's a little daunting as well. Uh, associate professor, what's that mean? It seems like a shinier title, that must be good, but um, what's it all mean? But don't get too wrapped up in that without also taking a moment to celebrate. So congratulations on your, your promotions to associate professor. Um, I'd like to take also a moment to thank Julia and her team uh, and Senior Vice Provost uh, Barbara Rodriguez for putting together this program and programming to support faculty and faculty development. Um, we hope to have a new Associate Provost for Faculty Development soon, so they'll have some help. But in the meantime, uh, this, this group has been just super in, in uh, developing these programs to support you, and I'd like to give them a round of applause. So I'm not going to say much. Mostly I want to uh, really just make this a Q&A and make it interactive. And, and so while I battle for two minutes or so, think about some questions you, you've always wanted to ask the guy in the tie, right? Um, what would be interesting to know or, or what thoughts do you have about what should happen next? You might have comments instead of questions. That's fine. Um, I do want to say that, you know, really moving from assistant professor to associate professor is a really important transition. I was 
telling uh, uh, Star Rodriguez as we were walking over, I remember exactly when I was sitting where you were sitting. Uh, we did it at the golf course at the University of Michigan in the clubhouse. I remember the provost coming. I remember uh, uh, some of the deans being there. I don't remember a single word that was said. <laughs> um, but I remember the event because it was, it was an important moment. Um, you do move into a new place, and, and Julia made this point. Um, we want you to have successful careers here. We want you to make contributions to the wealth of human knowledge here at the University of New Mexico. We want you to change the lives of our students for the next 40 years, or however long it is. That sounds daunting. Um, we want you to provide amazing service to the state of New Mexico, to the world, to your disciplines, to your professions. Uh, we want all of that to happen here. And that should sound daunting. As an associate professor, as a tenured professor, you've got a lot of freedom in, in what you do. No one can tell you what areas of, of research to pursue, what questions to study. Um, it's a lot of, of freedom in, in an intellectual sense, and that's terrific. And part of the challenge is to figure out how to structure it. The most important piece of advice I can give is you don't have to do everything at once. Right? And so each of us, as we go through our time as a faculty member, follow a trajectory, a career trajectory in which during this period of time, I focus on this, and during this period of time, I focus on this. There have been times in my career when I focused on graduate student mentorship. There have been times in my career when I focused on teaching freshmen. There have been times in my career when I focused on helping to run a large, uh, a large center, a large research center. That's all good, right? It's, it's the sort of the totality that, that makes a faculty career, and it doesn't all have to happen at once. I don't have to focus on graduate mentorship, teaching, uh, the running a center, everything all at once, because all of us are only human. And we have to do all those things. We have to, to we can't neglect our students. We have to be good teachers. We have to give them the education they deserve, the intellectual development they deserve. We need to move our scholarship forward. All I'm saying is your emphasis can change over time. And keep that in mind. And, and be a little bit planful. Think about, okay, what's the trajectory going to be? And you should be open to serendipity and open to opportunity that may change. And, and I need to leap on that, and that's good. But also be a little thoughtful. What do I want to do? Why? How can these pieces of think, how can these things that interest me be put together into a sort of synergistic whole? So a little bit of thinking and planning is, is good as well. Um, and so I'm not going to say much more other than, than to encourage you to be thoughtful. Don't try and do everything at once. But remember, you're here for the long haul. The University of New Mexico wants you to have amazing careers here. Our job as administrators is to help you and help our students be successful. Um, and so that's, that's what we're here for. Uh, and don't forget to celebrate. Celebrate the wind, smell the roses, it's totally worth it. And really, I would love to take questions, hear ideas, uh, hear thoughts, comments, however you want to go. Yeah? I, that felt like a plan. That, that hand, up, <laughs> hand went up way too fast. I just wanted to say in front of all of us here how much um, I appreciate the way that you have extended yourself to listen to the concerns of faculty. Six of us had an opportunity to sit in your room with Barbara, and um, we were very pleased with your listening, um, your um, welcoming, and um, knowing this is a complex state, multilingual, multicultural, and the pressures that we all have to, to do the work. So thank you for helping us slow down a little bit. But we're urgent about getting that work done. <laughs> It's because there's a lot of important things to do. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, other comments or questions? And by the way, I am a professor too. I know how to force you to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> or he will ask you questions. That's, that's one way. <laughs> that's one way. <laughs> yes? Um, I remember reading something about uh, associate professors being the most unhappy of all. <laughs>
let's continue to be um, productive in doing research for anatomy. Like, for example, <coughs> we have some small seed grants, very small at the UNH, which could be like $10,000. Um, I forgot the name of the program. Um, yeah. Right. And, and that's good, but I wonder what is out there specifically for us who are not the new kids anymore, but not full professors here. So we are like in the new mode. Some, some people define that. Well. Yeah. So, so I'm, I am the youngest of three kids, right? My oldest, uh, the, the oldest kid in our family was my sister. I'm the youngest. In the middle is my brother. Associate professors feels like the middle kid, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not the baby, you're not the first, right? It's, it's kind of this, this different space. Um, there's a, a program that uh, I know the, the folks are putting on uh, about, uh, what's it called, the sort of the associate professor letdown. Yeah, um, well, yeah, you just, what you did was just outline the rest of this session. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, but let me address it a little bit. So, and, and so I'll address that bigger issue and then talk a little bit about some specifics. Um, any major event where you have, you've been thinking in some way about this moment for six years. Right? Any major event where you've been working towards it for a long time, when you get there, there's always an immediate subsequent sense of, now what? Right, a sense of letdown. It's, it's a, just a common psychological effect because your focus has been on this moment. The focus has been on, I need to get to uh, and so immediately afterwards, there's always a sense of letdown. And I say that to first normalize the experience. Right? It is completely normal for each of us when we become an associate professor or have any other, reach any other major goal in our life to, to afterwards go, boy, this, you know, I, I don't quite feel as happy as I thought I should feel. Um, it's a, partially about our own expectations of ourselves. It's partially about there was a very clear goal tenure. Now there's not a very clear goal. Right? And one of the challenges for the associate professor is to think about what, where do I want to be in my scholarship, in my teaching? What is my goal? And with that, that freedom of tenure <coughs> comes the, the kind of awful realization that I set my own goal. Right? In some sense, the university set a goal for you up to now, get tenure. You had to choose your research path to get there, but there was a clear kind of goal. Um, it's a little more nebulous now. The transition from associate to full seems like a little more nebulous of a, of a goal than tenure, which has a very clear implication in so many strong and important ways. So I do want to normalize that sense. Um, I think one of the, the most important things for associate professors to do, especially new associate professors, is to really start to look around the institution and, and take that opportunity to say, who's here that's doing cool stuff? Who's here that I want to know? Maybe that I want to work with, but I, I've discovered that in multiple institutions, one of the most useful things to do is to simply know other people who are doing interesting work mm -hmm. and to learn from them and hear what they're doing. It, it makes the entire experience of being here a lot more interesting and enjoyable to recognize you're in this really bright, creative community. And through that, you find collaboration. And so my, my own research trajectory, I, you know, I got up through and I became associate professor, and I didn't quite know what I was going to do afterwards. I found whole new research directions when I became an associate professor, um, and, and as, I, as I approached full and when I became full, because I started working with people I never worked with before on problems I never thought I was interested in, I didn't even know about. Uh, I, uh, my basic background is mathematics and computation. I do computational physics, if you like. When I became an associate professor, I started working with experimentalists. And, and sorry, my face probably makes that look like, oh, experimentalists. <laughs> um, I started working, and it was fascinating. It was fun. It was different. It was a whole different way to think about the kind of mathematical, mathematical and computational work that I had done. Um, they didn't let me do experiments. I just broke stuff. Um, but I worked with experimentalists. I'd never done that. And so I really encourage you uh, at this moment of, of transition to think about what are the new things I could do and engage with and work on um, in order to find interesting, new, exciting problems. And those collaborations, they're sources of support. They're sources not just of, of intellectual support and emotional support, they're sources of funding support as well. And so 
Yeah, you're right. The, the, uh, the startup package is gone, but there's new opportunities to reach into to new resources, certainly through, for, for those of you who work in, in these kinds of fields, through external <coughs> resources, but also through collaborations with others and bringing something of value to the work that they're doing. That leads to funding sources as well. So besides those kind of seed grants, I really encourage collaboration as a way to find interesting new problems and new sources of uh, support to, to drive that agenda forward. Uh, so, so look for those opportunities very much. Other question? Oh yeah, Sarita. I, I don't know if it's obnoxious to ask about this at this point, but I, I don't know much about going to how is that so different? It seems to be the same kind of ambition, need mm -hmm. to Use. Sure, um, and and so I'm going to give an answer, and and, and Barbara's going to listen very carefully because I've been here two months and she's been here longer, and so if I say anything wrong, she's got a big hook. And she's like, Rrr. Um, <laughs> but I'm not going to get into process and procedure. I want to say sort of intellectually, um, when I think about the way we look at the the scholarship and the work of associate prof of going from assistant to associate professor, it's are you showing a clear trajectory towards growth and development as a scholar? Is there recognition of uh, that growth and development of, of a scholar through both your peers at this institution and your peers at other institutions? That's the purpose of those external letters we do. That's the, the normal normalization, if you will, from, from others in your discipline at other places. <coughs> As you move forward and going to full, what are the differences? Well, one, of course, is there's no concrete timeline, right? There's a sort of a rough, we have a general idea, but there's no concrete timeline. But we're really starting to look for evidence of really strong impact on the discipline in the field, right? And so there are people who are taking your ideas and building new work from it. That's impact on the discipline, impact on the field. And so you have changed the, the direction that others are going through your work. And those others may be not just nationally in the US, but internationally. So we're looking for that sense of impact um, that is, you know, we're going from, we see a clear trajectory of growth and impact to the field is changing because of what you're doing. Others are looking at your work and saying, this changed the way I think about a question. This changed the way I think about a problem. And so that's in some sense the difference. It's, and, and again, the timeline is, is less definite because in some sense the, the time frame over which that impact happens is different as well. And because you're making choices about, I'm gonna focus here right now or I'm gonna focus there right now. Uh, and so I, ho I hope that helps, but it's really that greater sense of impact on the discipline and, and the field and a wider reach of that impact uh, across the, the um, not just in, in, this is what I think is important, not just across the, the world of uh, other scholars, but across the world, you're impacting the world itself, and not just the community of scholars. And, and, um, and I don't want that to sound frightening. Um, there, one of the other things to think about, there's no one criteria, right? We're not saying check. Um, and so we're looking at a totality of a body of work and we see scholars who have changed the way others think about questions, that's impact. We see scholars who have changed the way that the uh, federal government um, does economic analysis, that's impact. Yeah, there's a question here. Well, I just wanted to build off that comment. Just, it's more about just a comment. Um, as I've noticed in my department, um, some people get stuck at associate, which I guess is common in a lot of places, but I've noticed a lot of women who take on a disproportionate amount of service. So I think, you know, I want to now really jump into the service because I see the way my senior colleagues have done a ton, but I'm also just fearful of also getting stuck at that point. So we're, we're going to talk about that. Great. Yeah. We're going to actually talk about everything you all have asked. So this is perfect. Yeah. And, and, and let me, but let me reinforce what you're saying. I think that's one, it's a real phenomenon. Right, it, it absolutely does happen, and and therefore it's one to be very conscious about. And, and the first step in, in addressing any challenge or problem is recognizing it and naming it. And so you've done that. And as as Julia says, there's some tools and ways to think about this that can help you navigate that. Because we don't want you to get stuck 
um, and that <coughs> the joint return for its full because you were making the university a better place. Mm -hmm. That's a bad reason to get stuck. <coughs> Time for so, one more? Okay, one more question. I enjoy it. Good. <laughs> or not? Okay. Oh. Easy one. Yep. Excellent. <coughs> but this is very simple. I'm just counting to seven. In in, in most yeah. places, in most U.S. cultures, uh -huh. you just can't make it to seven before someone breaks the silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you prefer red or green? Oh, great question. Um, so I've answered this question before, and, and I will give the same answer because it's a very provostial <laughs> answer. So I've been in and out of New Mexico for 30 years. Um, and I've never lived here, but. but colleagues here, students here, work here. Um, but mostly I've been at Albuquerque and North, and so my prior experience would make me say red. But there's two thirds of the state I haven't experienced, which is green, and so I need to go and learn more. Here, is that a nice political answer? <laughs> Thank you. This was a great lead-in to what we're going to do. Um, if we went around the room and asked everyone how they responded to getting their letter of promotion from the provost, we'd get a huge range from elated to none to, really? This is it? Um, and all of those are normal. And some of you have some really clear ideas about what you want to do next, and some of you don't. And that, that's OK. That is also normal. So it is normal is this huge range. And it's important to really realize you've got some time to think about this. And one of the reasons we started New Professor Orientation is, yes, with time, associate professors become the unhappiest professors. And we do not want you to be those people. And here to tell you more about it is um, <laughs> Tina Tagetz-Vesbach from Biology, who's going to show you the research on this. And then after that, Barbara and I are going to talk about all kinds of ways you could not be that person. <laughs> Thanks. Make sure I know how to work this. Okay, well, um, I hope Engineers, you're not... we just solve problems. <laughs> I hope you're not getting tired of hearing congratulations. Um, and I really, I don't want you guys to forget how good it feels to, um, you know, to make tenure because, um, you know, even to this day, I still try to remind myself what an accomplishment um, it was to make tenure and then full. Um, and it's something that you really need to remember it, over the next six years as you progress in your career um, because what you've done is a big accomplishment. Um, and, you know, I'm here to tell you about. Um, you know, some research showing that associate professors are the least satisfied um, at their institution. I'll show you the data to that. But also some ideas about how to, um, you know, not get stuck in a rut and don't be that dissatisfied person. So um, these uh, data that I'm going to be showing you are based on um, uh, for example, the COACH survey, which includes 69 different institutions and over 13,000 respondents. But what they found was that, um, and this is, you know, time and again, different uh, surveys have found this, that the recently hired and, and the older professors are the happiest at their institution. It makes sense. You land your first job and um, you can't believe it and you haven't started doubting yourself yet, maybe. And, um, and so you're feeling good about it. And then also, once you get older, it's like, you know, everything's fine anyway. So <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe a little senility, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's those of us, um, actually, I'm not in my 40s anymore, but you know, in their late 40s um, or eight years after hiring that um, are really starting to question, you know, where they are and where they're going and um, the dissatisfaction can set in. And so here's the hard data from the coach survey. And you can see they did a good job sampling across the different ranks. And um, what they found was this typical U-shaped curve um, 
that is, uh, it dips in the middle in terms of age, and this is satisfaction, very satisfied versus very dissatisfied. And so it's the people in the middle that tend to be the most dissatisfied. When they um, you know, break this apart based on rank, what you see is that it's associate professors are, that are the most dissatisfied. And this is across institutions across the US. Um, of course, the longer you're an assistant professor and learn more about your institution, maybe you get a little dissatisfied, but then you make associate and you get happy again, but then it starts setting in. And then, of course, full, we're all just happy. Um, well, if you break the associates apart even more, what you see is that um, associates that have been around for six years or less um, have satisfaction levels uh, similar to the full professors, but the associates that have been here for, that have been in rank for six years or more are the ones who are the most dissatisfied. So, I'm not here to tell you, you know, there's, well, there's no rule that says you have to go up for full. But I think these data speak clearly that, you know, you should get in and get out as quickly as possible, okay? So, I want to help you do that. Okay, so, um, what um, are some of the causes of the dissatisfaction? One is, um, once you make it to associate, after you enjoy that, that initial elated feeling of having made it, um, this sort of uh, disillusionment sets in. And um, you, know, you were <coughs> focused on this goal, uh, you know, to become an associate professor, now it's like, well, I don't have to become a full if I don't want to, right? So it's not so, so much goal-driven anymore. But you also might be asking yourself, you know, what's this all about? And then, okay, well now I'm an associate professor, is this all there is? And, and, and then the one that was really, um, you know, strong for me was, where am I going from here? So when I made associate professor, um, I feel like I had exhausted my research, um, my research focus. I had um, asked all the questions I wanted to, and um, I didn't give up, but I was, I really spent about a year, year and a half thinking about, well, what do I want to do next? And it was a little scary. And so this, um, this situation actually has a name and um, it includes post-tenure malaise, slump, dissatisfaction, blues, or PTDS. And so, um, uh, what are some of the causes besides these existential questions that can um, lead to PTDS? So, for example, now that you've made associate, the pressure is not going to relent. You're still going to be um, expected to be producing, producing even more, making more of an impact and you might question whether or not you can do that. You're also going to find you're um, going to have a lot more uh, responsibility in your department, and you may choose to become involved at the university level too. Um, one problem that's really uh, uh, prominent is that salary, salary compression is greatest at associate professor. It can be really frustrating to see people uh, being hired around you as assistant professor making as much or more than you are making as an associate professor after being here for you know, six or seven years. You might start thinking about, okay, well, how am I gonna make full? I don't even know what the criteria are. The criteria seem nebulous to me. And then um, also there's your personal responsibilities. This tends to be a period where um, child rearing or caring for our parents can really weigh on us. And then also there's these other existential questions. Um, so once you get to your mid-career, you're supposed to have it all figured out, but now you don't feel like you know it all anymore. Um, you might be wondering about um, academia in general and um, you know, it's, is it valued anymore in this country? Um, are of, uh, knowledge valued? And, um, and then finally, um, you know, the question that I struggled with was, have I done everything I can in my field? 
that I want to do. So, um, some of my titles are missing, but I'll tell you <laughs> what this is about. So, how can you um, get over this, this PTDS? And um, the most important thing you can do is take a break, reset, and then plan to move forward. So, again, I want you to celebrate, but I don't want you to forget that feeling ever of um, having made it. Um, for me, this period, the year after I, I made associate, it was a time to reconnect with my family in ways that I wasn't able to when I was you know, pushing for associate. Um, but then a really effective way for me to not get anxious about things is to just plan ahead, figure out where I'm going. And so, you don't want to just be thinking about the next five years, you want to be thinking about the next 10, 15 years. Because if you're just focusing on the next five years, you're going to um, you know, lose the, the, the big picture and, and that can lead to more disillusionment. And so start thinking about um, how you want to be viewed by your colleagues and um, you know, by your community now that you've made associate. And, um, and, you know, there are things that you have to do as an associate professor, but really think hard about what you want to do. So, um, you know, what do you want to contribute to your um, professional organizations? Who do you want to become as an educator now that you have the freedom of tenure? Um, how do you want to mentor your students better now that you um, don't have that urgency of making uh, tenure? How do you want to contribute to the university as a whole? And, um, and then don't forget about yourself. Um, you know, who do you want, what do you want to do for yourself? What is going to fulfill you? You don't have to worry so much about making the members of your, of your department happy anymore. It's more, what do you want to do? And enjoy that. And so, um, I think it's good to plan early because if you don't have an agenda, you become someone else's agenda. And remember, there's no maximum timeline for becoming a, a professor, but um, it's never too early to start planning. So. Um, one way to start planning already is to meet with other full professors that you feel comfortable with in your department and ask them what they expect to see for someone going up for full. So you can start envisioning how you're going to attain these goals. And then, of course, make a plan with your chair. Um, sit down with your chair and um, try to understand what the department's stated goals are for full promotion and start thinking about how you are going to meet those goals. Remember that it's, um, and I think Julie is gonna say this too, but you make your own narrative, okay? You don't have to you know, make full meeting some very strict criteria. Uh, you can make your story fit those criteria. And there's a lot of freedom and, and fun in that, I think. Okay, so again, Plan for five years, but look ahead to 50. Think of a in terms of a lifetime of contributing to your field and, um, and to the university. And um, of course, don't get focused on the immediate highs and, and don't let um, you know, uh, a failure here or there get you down. A bad class or a bad semester, I've had them. Um, don't let that be a referendum on who you are as a professor. And there's a great article about this to check out. Okay. Um, and sorry, the coloring changed on this, but um, what this says is that you know we are the kind of people that like to figure things out ourselves. And, um, and I've noticed this about myself that I have a hard time asking for advice, and I feel like I really had a hard time with that when I was going up for um, associate. And But what I've learned is that some of my biggest breakthroughs have been when I reach out to people and ask them for advice and um, and take some help from from the people in your department and, mm -hmm. and listen to them. 
Okay, so just to um, finish up here, um, I don't want you guys to get stuck in a rut. You um, should make it to full. I think uh, um, one of our colleagues over here was mentioning about how some people get stuck as associate professor. Um, statistically, I think that tends to be uh, women and people of color more often. Um, it can happen if you take on too much um, administrative work or, um, or committee work. But, um, you know, I want to see all of you guys make um, full as, you know, as rapidly as you're able to. So um, here's some resources to help you move forward. And, um, and one of the, uh, for those, you know, who might need some help with writing, I can highly recommend Dr. Lynn Bean. I use her all the time and use her with my students too. So with that, are there any questions I can answer? Yes. So uh, I noticed you left out a thing that uh, I think is pretty important, and that is uh, sabbatical. We're going to talk about it. Right, but as part of my growth immediately following, you know, like, is that something I should be going out and reaching out to people to? Is that like cars? Is that like, you know, a world of wellness? Like, how am I supposed to integrate, uh, you know, getting post, you know, my post tenure depression? I mean, is sabbatical something that I can use effectively as, you know, sort of part of this whole, you know, because I think as someone mentioned, one of the issues with sabbatical is, you know, reintegrating uh, back at UNM, back in your department. I mean, uh, you know, I know my department turnover has been pretty high, and, you know, I could think being away for 12 months, uh, things will be different, you know, things will be different. You'll have a different chair, we'll have some new faculty, some faculty that I worked with will have left. Um, you know, so how, how does that fit in and does it fit in? Because I'll say, you know, based on, you know, looking at sort of what you suggested, it didn't seem to fit in very well. Well, so, I mean, I use my sabbatical um, to uh, find my way uh, forward from my research. Like I said, I felt like I asked all the questions I really wanted to and, um, and uh, I used it to learn a new method and take my research in a new direction. And so, um, yes, I definitely recommend using your sabbatical as a time for thinking about where you want to go and, and, and if you have the ability to, um, to plan a sabbatical that's going to um, allow you to really think about um, you know, what you want to do next and maybe gain some new um, techniques that are going to allow you to get over that hump of where do I go now? So, sabbatical is definitely instrumental on that. Yeah. If we are going to sing one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. So, a bigger answer to your question is you actually have a lot of opportunities. And one way to get through this is to start to appreciate the opportunities you have that you may not have consciously thought about. Yeah. So we're going to go back and forth between opportunities and expectations and talk to you about um, how to manage some things you're going to be expected to do, but also some ways, different ways to frame some of this and think about um, opportunities. So, how many of you have applied for a scout? Okay. How many of you have received excerpted feedback from the external reviews from your chair? We're going to talk, okay, good, we're going to talk about that. Okay, some of this is going to be a design your own workshop. Um, I will say, um, we've got a lot of material and we're going to pick which material to cover based on the answer to the questions and you're going to receive a copy of the whole presentation. So, um, you're, you're going to get this. Okay, so Barbara's going to talk about these two. Um, how many of you have had your chair request a meeting? to talk about your role, now that you're an associate professor. <laughs> okay, that's going to be a theme throughout the whole thing. Okay, research shows many people, don't tell the provost this, many people use sabbaticals to recover. Honestly, this is, this is what the research shows. It, you can also use it to get new ideas, get new methods, think about things, work on writing projects, 
but it serves a range of purposes. One thing you can do you may not think about, you can use a sabbatical to regain control of your schedule. Some of you are already doing a lot of service. Well, you can't do service while you're on sabbatical. So this is your time to think about it and negotiate what your service load is going to be afterwards. And we're going to talk about service um, in a few minutes. But this is a time you can reset and think about what's the meaningful service you want to do that helps the department, the university, your profession, and that you enjoy. Because there should be pieces of that you can enjoy. You're tired of what you've been teaching? This is a time to think about switching it up. Don't volunteer to do three new courses the first semester of that. But if there's one you're sick of, no, let's do what, what's intriguing to you. What would you like to teach? This is a time to do something new. But don't overcommit, right? It's, it's really easy to say, oh, well, that's a year off. I'll have plenty of time. I'll keep in mind, no, you won't. Whatever you're doing now that's keeping you busy, other things will enter onto your calendar to keep you busy. Um, this is something academics are particularly bad about, right? Because we get asked to do a chapter in a book that's due in 18 months. And we think, oh, yeah, that's easy, because I'll have finished all this other stuff by then. But if you do too many of those, then you're back right where you were. So the sabbatical can be a really nice time to reset your schedule and think about how you want to spend your time. So I'm going to let Barbara talk about the process and mechanics. And if you've got questions about the process and the mechanics, please ask now. So. Great. So I saw a few hands go up for those of you who have already thought about taking a sabbatical, might have already scheduled a sabbatical, may have already submitted the application for sabbatical. It varies from unit to unit as to how these things are negotiated with department chairs. My advice to you is begin talking with your department chair now about scheduling that sabbatical, especially if you are in a small unit with very few faculty. It'll take some negotiating and some scheduling to make sure that that sabbatical can take place in a seamless manner. <coughs> I want to address your question about integration. There's always change in an academic unit, always. And if you wait for the perfect time to take a sabbatical and that it's going to be stable and there won't be change, you won't ever take a sabbatical. Um, place yourself first and think about the department as this well-oiled machine that will continue operating whether you're there or not. Now is your time to recover. Now is your, your time to retool. Now is your time to think about your research program going forward. So a little bit about the process. You can take a sabbatical for one semester or a full year. The difference is, um, of course, in time and the pay. So if you take a full sabbatical for the entire year, you get two-thirds of your salary and pay. Typically, we see applications for sabbatical before um, August through May. That's the academic year sabbatical. You can also apply for a sabbatical across the calendar year. That means from January through December. Those are less common, but they are certainly an opportunity for you to think about. If you take a, two, a full year's uh, sabbatical, you'll have two-thirds pay. The full semester sabbatical, you'll have full pay. There are um, a variety of documents that you need to submit to your department chair. You might have a committee within your department review the documents for approval, goes into the dean's office, and ultimately hits my desk. Very rarely once, I have not ever once, and I've not been in this role very long, but I've seen a variety of different sabbatical plans, reports, and I have not, I have approved all of them. I have approved sabbatical plans that come in late. So, you know, there's flexibility as to the timeline. From my perspective, you'll have to negotiate with deans and department chairs, but please feel free to ask. All we can say is we can schedule this at another time. 
but I haven't run across that issue at all. I'm very open to thinking about how we can make sure we can accommodate your needs and make sure that the department's needs are handled while you're out on sabbatical. There are soft deadlines that I refer to. They're very, they're soft from my perspective. Other people might say these are hard deadlines and you have to adhere to them. But for me, they're soft. Um, deadline for the spring semester coming up is September 9th, which is yeah. come and gone. Yeah. But if you are looking at a sabbatical and the department can handle it, let's talk because we, could, we might be able to get that done for you. Again, it has to be approved by all of the individuals identified here. Okay. I find it interesting that our past practice has been that candidates who go through the tenure and promotion process have no idea what external reviews have, have said about your work. Because I would find it very useful to help me think forward, think ahead about the coming years and the path to full professorship if I had that feedback from external reviewers. There's nothing secret about this. We redact, of course, the, the names of the individuals who provide you the feedback, the institutions. We shuffle that feedback around so that the confidentiality can be maintained. Make sure you talk to your department chair about securing that information so that it's helpful for you moving forward. If you have difficulty, I have had requests come directly to me. We hold all of the information in academic affairs. We are happy to accommodate requests. If we get a flood of requests, it might take us some time. But I think it is highly valuable for all of you to get that kind of feedback as you think ahead and, and plan out your sabbatical, plan out the next several years as you move toward full professorship. Questions about any of that? Yeah. Uh, of supplementals, um, salary is allowable during uh, during sabbatical. Are there grants and, and other sources of income that one can apply for to supplement the salary loss? Any external funds that you already have in place, for example, if you have some of your salary being paid off an extramural grant, that can stay in place to supplement the portion that isn't paid during the full year sabbatical. Yes? I have a question about the frequency of the sabbatical. I heard that uh, you can actually choose to take a one semester of sabbatical every three years instead of one year of sabbatical every six years. I, I just don't know how. There is a statement in the faculty handbook that refers to that schedule. I haven't seen it used very frequently. People mm -hmm. tend to take the six year, the continuous six years of um, service and then apply for a sabbatical, but there is that prorated kind of statement in the faculty handbook. So make sure you look at C200 in the faculty handbook to be real clear about that. And I'm not real clear right now, otherwise I'd, I'd repeat it right back to you. I don't have the faculty handbook memorized. All right, thank you. My thoughts. No, I don't. <laughs> can, I, can I add one thing to you know, Going to your chair and asking for some feedback about that external review process is so helpful, so I really encourage you to do it. And while Barbara can <coughs> take external letters and extract them and, and anonymize them and so on, she's not in your discipline. Right? Right. And so there's a lot of value in making that a conversation with your, with your right. department chair because she can think about those letters in the context of the work of the discipline. I could do it for two individuals here, but not everyone. <laughs> Laura? Yeah, um, I'm going to return that question of making a kind of shortfall of the salary. So, like, if you have a fellowship, like a in residence fellowship somewhere, how does that work if, if they pay you X amount, like, say, $45,000 or $50,000? For a one semester sabbatical? No, for a year semester. For, like, for year. a year. I don't think that it has been a problem at all. If it's an external source of funding to make up for the salary loss during the full year of sabbatical, we would have to have look at some of the documentation, but. I mean, what happens with the 50,000? Do you get all of it? Do you have to It would it? have to be. Um, part of it or? That would have to be detailed in the fellowship information. 
the agency that provides the funds for you, we would have to look at those contractual agreements. <coughs> but one so option case probably, by case. Sorry, one option is probably yeah. summer seller, for example. One option could be summer seller, oh. for example. Yeah. So those really critically depend on case by case. Yeah. But yeah and the agency's yeah. right stipulations. So if you have something like that and you'd like for me to take a look at it, I'd be happy to do that for you. Because it is really a case by case. I don't, but I'm just wondering like yeah. that was yeah. my game plan was to yep. apply for different fellowships. And you should. And you should, definitely. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. I have a question on how specific dates are determined. The example that you gave for a one year sabbatical were August through May versus January through December, which is a difference of two months. And that both of those examples are for a one year sabbatical. Correct. How is, which to me is very different, because one has you, more. It, it's when you're on contract. You're not on contract in the summer. So, you know, it would really be August through August. But but it's it's when are we worried about teaching and service in the department? Got it. And then your semesters sabbatical, the fall semester dates or the spring semester dates. So all the work that I've been doing over the summer, I shouldn't have been doing. That. You're not on contract in the summer, not unless you have a summer summer research, summer administrative component, some paid responsibility. Um, for the institution or for a research grant or a contract. But, like but most of us, of course, work regardless. Yeah. <clears throat> so there are a lot of different paths to promotion to professor. You have a lot more flexibility. You might have been, you might have had sleepless nights over the excellence language for promotion to associate, excellence in teaching and research. That language is not in the promotion to professor policy at the university level. So you've got a lot more flexibility in terms of developing a balanced portfolio where you and your department can figure out what that means. So this means you can really sort of craft your, class, your path to overall excellence, um, and you really get to write your narrative. Um, I, we sort of, talk about it as a write your own adventure story um, when we do promotion planning workshops. So Advance will be doing a promotion planning workshop in the spring. We're doing these every other year right now. It's going to sort of help you think about different ways to think about this. And I want to say, at some point you should sit with your chair and talk about this, and it's okay if you're not ready this year. Sometime before your third year as an associate professor, you should feel ready. But it's okay if you don't feel ready right now takes people different amounts of time, as Tina was saying, to sort of figure out you know, what the narrative's going to be. Give yourself that time. You've got some flexibility. So, expectations. You're supposed to take a more active role in running this place. It's, it's yours now. We need your help. Um, we do want you involved in service, but we don't want it to derail you. If you're already doing a lot of service, we are not saying you need to do more. Some of you have been protected, and it's time to contribute. If you feel like you've been doing a lot, you probably have. Do not take this as meaning you need to do more. It's let's rethink what you're doing. We obviously want you to continue to do research, scholarship, creative activity. You're going to get asked to evaluate your colleagues here for mid-promotion and promotion and tenure, and you're going to start getting requests to evaluate colleagues at other places. And you're going to be asked to participate in peer evaluations of teaching, if you haven't already, and be expected to help mentor the junior faculty in your department. On the other hand, you've also got these great opportunities. You can try riskier ideas. You can try ideas that might fail. You can try new collaborations that might not work out. You can try different styles of teaching. You can take a different approach to a class because if it doesn't work, it's okay. It isn't a defining moment about your talent or your career. You can take on some leadership roles. You can be more professionally active if you have an activity you enjoy. If you've been wanting to do more community work, which can take a long time to get off the ground, it's safe to try that now. And you can, whoops, you can recover the parts of your life 
that you think you sacrificed to get tenure. You may have been sacrificing them since grad school, because in some ways you've been working towards this moment since grad school. So really take this time to think about, all right, what do I enjoy that I've given up or that I do less of? It could be music, it could be going to museums, it could be hiking, it could be spending time with your family, it could be hanging out with friends. This is your career. Find a way that brings some balance to it so that you can enjoy it. So this, um, I really like PhD hugs. So the first one is before grad school, I'm going to research whatever I want. As a grad student, I'm going to research whatever my professor wants. As an assistant professor, I'm going to research whatever my tenure committee wants. And now as a tenured professor, I'm going to research whatever my grant committee wants. So, as it, the, the left is the untenured professor, how was your spring break? Good, I got a grant application finished, a book review done, three papers submitted, an exam put together. How about you, tenured professor? Good, I went skiing in Colorado. <laughs> We all, we all have to be this person who like spent the weekend working, but sometimes you can be this other person and give yourself permission to do it and enjoy it and don't feel guilty. You're going to be a more creative, engaged faculty member if you bring back in the things in your life that you enjoy and enjoy them feeling like you've earned them because you have. Don't. Don't give the institution your life. Give it your, make it your professional life, but you've got a personal life. And to enjoy being here, you've got to work on that piece too. So if you feel like you've given up pieces of that, give yourself permission to build it back in. You can do that and still make good progress. So you can develop new ideas, new collaborations, try all kinds of things, but do you have to? Should you want to? This is your career. This is not someone else's career. There are parts of the time on the track to tenure you probably felt like you were meeting other people's expectations. So I can't say this enough. Think about what do you want? What do you want to do? What makes your career meaningful? Working with students. Don't forget about the Center for Teaching Excellence. They have a range of workshops that can be helpful. I've done their two-day course design institute to rethink a course. That can be really useful. Um, they're also really good at helping you with little things. If you just want to start, say, experimenting with small forays into bringing active learning into your classroom, they can, they can give you some hints on ways to slowly introduce new things. So, Please use them as a resource. Think broadly about how you want to be now as a teacher and a mentor when it's a lot more up to you. You can't afford to have some classroom fails as long as you learn from them and you know, figure out what to do next time. So you can really think about how you want to be in the classroom for the long term. You're going to get asked to do peer evaluation of teaching. So start by finding out if your department has any process, guidelines, forms they use. Some do, a lot don't. And keep in mind, observing one class, it's a little snapshot. It's a little glimpse. Um, this one, your evaluation will be based on what you do in the next 30 seconds. Go. You know, my entire impression of you as a teacher is based on the next 50 minutes. Go. Um, it's not a pop quiz. Um, what you're trying to do is find ways to help your colleagues be more effective educators. And if you didn't have that experience, think about what sort of experience would have been helpful for you. If you did have that experience, how was it helpful for you? And then how can you translate that to helping your colleagues? So some things to think about you might not think about when you're, when you're evaluating teaching, for example. Is the classroom helping or hurting? Um, I was recently evaluating a junior faculty member who's in this little tiny classroom. Some of the students have desks with fold-up, you know, writing surfaces. Some are perched on stools. Um, he can't simultaneously display a slide and write on it. This is nuts. It is amazing how well he is doing. You know, this has to become a top priority. Get him out of that classroom. 
What's the atmosphere in the class? Are there things you can suggest that can actually help the person be more effective in that sense? What's attendance? Is there an opportunity for participation? In the context of what they're doing, is it a freshman class or graduate class? How are they doing? So if your department is one that says, you know, go, go evaluate a class and write it up, you want to meet with the person first, you want to look at their syllabus, you want to understand what the course is, what are their goals for the course. Agree upon a date, you're going to go there, it's not a pop quiz, you're trying to give them feedback, you want them to do well. And if you show up and they've come down with the crud and are there anyway, you can come back a different time, it's, it's not a quiz. Um, sit in the back, because then you can watch the students, and you can watch their body language, and you can see what's happening. And you might escape the notice of some of the students, which will help the colleague you're evaluating. You know, make notes, then meet with them as soon as you can and talk about your impressions. There may be things you want them to know that you don't want to put in writing to the department, and that's cool. You're trying to help them be better. And then you write something up and you should give it to the faculty member and to the department chair. The faculty member should get it from you. It shouldn't just go into the department. And there are some, some departments that have a far more elaborate peer evaluation system than this, but if you're in one where you're, you know, you go in once and watch, these are some things to think about and you can get a lot of support from the Center for Teaching Excellence um, in doing this as well. The other thing you're going to have to do pretty quickly that you haven't done before is participate in milestone reviews. So now you're going to have a vote on the mid-promotion and promotion and tenure. And as part of this, you should start thinking about, you just went through this process. What in the department was helpful for you? What was confusing for you? Are there ways you can make this process more clear and less stressful for the colleagues coming behind you? Don't, don't win as well. It really sucked for me, it had better really suck for you. Um, that actually doesn't improve the institution. You're going to get asked to externally evaluate promotion and tenure files. And for some of you, the first thought is like, whoa, wait, no, I, I, I'm not qualified. Well, yeah, actually, you are now. Um, and you want to pay it forward. People just helped you by evaluating your. So you want to pay it forward and help a colleague that you may not know. And the thing to keep in mind is if it's a strong file, constructive positive feedback is much better than just praise. Once again, pay it forward. What can help them develop their career? If there's problems, you have to point it out. But you want to think about this as this is your turn to help someone else in their career. Can I jump in? Yeah, please. Yeah, so you know, I think one of the things to think about, a couple of things to think about here, evaluating someone else's teaching. That's a huge opportunity to learn, for you to learn. Yeah. Here's someone who teaches a very different way. Evaluating someone else's casebook is a great opportunity to learn about somebody else's work, but also what do the casebooks look like? How do they vary? How do they differ? So as, as that moment comes, you know, evaluating casebooks typically in, in your role for, associate, for assistant to associate, it's still informative for thinking about what the process would look like for associate to pull. So as you approach that moment. And to echo this point Julia made about positive constructive feedback, when I read casebooks, and I get to read a lot of them, um, the external letters are really important and you're going to be writing external letters now. Those external letters are really important because they're the ones that tell us about the impact of the work on the field. I mean, outside of, of the peers who immediately know you here, uh, or at, 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 you know, at those candidates' home institution, those letters that you write now tell someone else, tell other senior faculty, other provosts, what this person's contribution was. And that's why a letter that says, Sarah's great, it's a positive letter, but it's not very useful. But Sarah's thinking about the, the structure of, of romantic literature of, of, in France in, in 1852 to 1879, really
really changed the way that, that several other people thought about and, and described that work and so on, that starts to be really helpful. Because right? then we can realize and say, oh, that's what this work means. Uh, and so think about those, those letters carefully and take them as opportunities to learn. And keep in mind your help, whether you're doing peer evaluation of teaching or this sort of evaluation, you're trying to help someone be a better them. You're not trying to help them be you. Yeah. Um, and hopefully your mentors have kept that in mind, but not everyone does. Um, so if you're watching, you know, someone teaching, you think, oh, I would never do that that way, but, huh, that seems to work. You know, that, that's a good thing. So you might not have seen this before. This is the ballot we use here. So when you're <coughs> evaluating someone for mid pro or promotion and tenure, you're going to get this ballot where you're going to ask be asked to briefly describe their teach, you know, how you evaluate their teaching and what evidence you use, their scholarship, what evidence did you use to come to these conclusions, their service, and any other considerations. The least helpful thing you can do is write excellent, good, excellent, great colleague. <laughs> okay. Um, no, your name goes on this. So no pressure, <laughs> but these get read by the department chair, and then they get read by the college or school promotion and tenure committee, and then they get read by the people on the provost promotion and tenure committee. So you are not only evaluating your colleague, you are demonstrating what you are like. So let's go for thoughtful, constructive university citizen. And that means taking the time to not just go four articles, that's our expectation. I mean, okay, I've done that sometimes. There, there are times you're gonna do that. But what you really want to do is talk about their scholarship and teaching in ways people outside of the department can't has been teaching a required undergraduate course that most students hate and yet has gotten great buy-in and better scores than we've ever seen. Um, you know, something. What's the context in which they're working and how have they been successful? This is really important information. And this is information your department chair is gonna use in their letter to the dean. So, and you can offer, you know, criticism as part of this. You may think someone should be tenured, but that they need to pay more attention to their teaching, or they haven't been doing a good job on the small service requirement. That, that's okay to express that. You can have some criticism and a positive vote. But this is your chance to sort of give some feedback, help that person potentially be better, but also Sorry, you're starting to show the rest of the university who you are. And so keep this in mind. These are worth spending some time on. I see some shaking heads. Questions? I actually want to comment or argue a little bit about this, because I was on the college or um, college a PMT committee last semester, last year, and all of that. I think people on this campus normally just use one sentence, but I think that might be actually useful. Because when people critique something, they bring their personality in all of those things. So our university is a research one. We say we prioritize the research that basically override everything else. And I think, especially when we're thinking about women and people of color, LGBTQ people of color, so forth, I think to forcing us to write so many comments there can open up many other issues. So if the person needs research, then needs to move on. Because I could actually justify in many ways this department is not welcoming diversity. So I'm certainly not suggesting that one bring 20-year department battles into this, which does happen. No. But um, the workshop we had for department chairs last year, I had several people from the Provost Promotion and Tenure Committee um, there, and they talked about how important these comments are, <coughs> particularly for um, cases that might be borderline. And I do think you have to assume 
Um, the process fundamentally works. I mean, committees can recognize when people are getting personal or bringing in departmental grudges. That is not helpful. But not so much. Some people who have a privilege don't see that. Oh, I agree. It's not a perfect system. I absolutely agree. Can I jump into that? Yeah. Yeah, so a couple of things, I think. So, so one, of course, is um, don't be that person. Right? So we're asking for an evaluation of the candidate's research, of their teaching, of their service. We're not asking, do you like them? You can hate them. I, I've worked with many people I didn't like. That doesn't happen. Um, this is a professional activity, not a personal activity. And so yet are there colleagues who will in, use this form as an opportunity to kind of dig at a colleague on a personal level? Yes. They shouldn't. You don't do that. Don't be that person. Make the university better. Um, can we tell when someone is doing a personal dig? Usually. Not always, but usually. And, and so it's not actually even a helpful tool to kind of uh, uh, get at your colleague. Um, but I, will all, I, I also want to, but, but again, what we do as faculty all the time is we evaluate people. That's all we actually do. We critique our students' ideas. We critique each other's ideas. We are professional critics. That is, that is a key part of what universities do. Provide critique of ideas, of techniques, uh, to make them better and stronger. So we're used to doing this. This is a new for us, to critique and provide constructive, helpful um, uh, analysis of a piece of work. We do it to our students all the time. We can, we can do it for our colleagues. And so I, I think we can provide helpful, critical comments here. These are not long forms. We're not asking for essays. Um, but it, it is helpful to know, you know this, this person has uh, an appropriate level of, of publication. The work has impact because of this. It would be good if they paid attention to something else. That's totally OK. Uh, and let me, let me address one other point. Yes, we're an R1 institution. Research is, is a big part of our mission. So is education, so is teaching. Uh, if, if I see a tenure case that says this is the greatest researcher in the world and they shouldn't be in a classroom with a student, that is not a no-brainer yes for me. That is a possible no for me. Teaching is important to this institution. So is research. So don't think of these as either wars. Um, now, I can't control what all of your colleagues think about that balance, but I can state from an institutional perspective, both are important. So I'm going to briefly cover some information on service. Um, it's going to go by quickly. I will send you, you will, you will have all the slides, and I'm happy to do one-on-one -on -one meetings about this. So congratulations, here's a committee. It is what some of you have you know, already had to deal with. Um, some of you have been protected from service, some of you haven't. Um, it is more of an expectation for a promotion to professor. It's actually in the promotion language than it is for a promotion to associate. Um, sort of at all levels, you don't have to do all levels at the same time. Once again, these are things you can, you can stagger and you can think about. Um, the university is better if we all contribute. Neither feigned helplessness nor martyrdom help the department or the institution. And I'm sure you've all seen examples. Don't be those people either. Bless you. There's explicit and implicit service demands. The explicit ones are the ones you're asked to do. The implicit ones are the ones that it's sort of assumed you'll do. You're African American. You'll work with all the African American students. You're a woman in engineering. You'll help all the women students. And we won't count it because it's something you do because you exist. Um, some of this sort of service is actually the most rewarding service. But it should count. So track it. Document it. Anything you do for a student is advancing the educational mission of this institution. Track it, document, use it in your teaching portfolios and teaching statements. Yes? So this is sort of connected. Sometimes I find that um, I'm working with a doctoral student and I'm not their advisor, but I'm almost spending more time with them than their advisor. So is that something 
you would recommend just documenting yes. the number of times I meet with a student? If it's unusual for your department, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, there's certainly, you should be tracking the students you were informally slash formally advise, you know, you're, yeah. you're sort of informally, yeah, formal. Yeah, absolutely. Track this stuff. Okay. Report it. Annual reviews, when you apply for promotion, you've got teaching statements again, you've got service statements, you should so be able narrative. The narrative, it's part of your narrative, it's who you are. You've got a lot of scope to develop really compelling narratives when you apply for promotion, because there's a bunch of different opportunities. So women mm -hmm. and faculty of color tend to have higher service loads. That's Do you mean by white men or men of color? Women, faculty, faculty of color. Women, faculty, and faculty oh, of I color, see. men and women, um, tend to, yes, tend to engage in more service than white men, and tend to get some of the housekeeping service, the, the stuff that has to be done to keep things going, but that isn't very high profile or prestigious. So there's two pieces. One is the sort of moral obligation to help people and that could be the service that really brings value. And then there's the, you might be more likely to be asked by chairs or deans or university leadership to do things because of your gender, race, ethnicity. And it can be hard to feel like you can say no to some of those. But you can say no to some of those. And you know, we, can, we can talk about some, some ways to do this. So just a few few tips, you want to be gracious, responsive, and yet protect your own time. Develop some rules that work for you. When I teach freshmen, I have, you know, you can have so many late homeworks. You can have this late, you can have that late, as long as you don't tell me why. They've got lives. They're busy. Um, if they are having some real crisis, I want to know and I will work with them. But if they just need to turn in, you know, there's 10 homeworks and three can be laid, they just, I, I just want to, you know, I don't want to know. Put your work, put your creativity into the assignment, not into telling me why it's late. I trust you, you've got a life. So think about how, you, how, the, how these things can work for you, where you're helping the students, but, you know, you're, you're directing your student time towards the ones that need it. Um, Know the resources we have available for students. We have a ton of resources for students on this campus at this point. If they're having personal problems, uh, mental problems, things that, you know, if they're homeless, food insecure, um, Lobo Respect has a tremendous amount of resources. So know where to help send students who are having problems. In terms of service, know what's normal in your department. An awful lot of our departments are not transparent about what service loads are. And you know, I want everyone working on having it be more common for service loads in departments for the department committees to be widely known. And in general, practice not saying yes right away. Practice saying, let me think about that. You know, let me get back to you. Um, so you can go off and stare at your calendar and ask some more questions. Um, don't take an open-ended service assignment. Some assignments you're likely to be asked to do can take at least a year to learn, like associate chair, graduate program director, things like that. They can be worth doing, but you know, agree on a time, maybe three years, which is long enough to learn the role and have an impact. But then, you know, negotiate a transition period and maybe a lighter load after that. Develop a balanced portfolio. Balanced is extremely field and department dependent, but you know, between the department and the university and your profession, be working on pieces of it, but you don't have to do it all at the same time. Once again, this is your chance to try something different. You could, for example, volunteer to be on a promotion and tenure committee, which will teach you more about how the university works and you'll meet some interesting colleagues. And you know, take notes all along the way. Hopefully you did this on the, this path. Don't stop documenting and just keeping track of what you do. A couple of things to ask yourself when you're asked to do something big, you know, why me? Do I actually have something to bring? Will it have an impact? Will this help me with my goals? You know, can I use it in other ways? Um, does it just give me a chance to meet new people or connect with people I want to connect with? And you know, what, what inter what's your internal barometer telling you? 
ask other people, you know, who's the committee chair? Who else is on the committee? How often does it be? What last time this committee was formed, what was the impact? Um, is there administration? What's the work, when in, when in the semester is the workload the highest on this committee? Um, and you're trying to learn the answers to some of the questions on the previous slide. And the most important thing, you are trying to figure out, is this a worthwhile expenditure of your time or a soul-destroying pit of despair? <laughs> and we have some. So you want to find out sooner rather than later. So develop a committee of no. Have a couple of friends, colleagues here um, who you can try, you know, okay, should I do this? That you can trust to help you figure out whether you should say no or yeah, actually this one you should do. So before you agree, get some advice. I think I'm going to skip over that one. If you get forced into, you know, if it's something where you know you're going to be in over your head or you really don't have time, try and say no. Sometimes we all get pressured into saying yes. Bail before you fail. What does bailing look like? Well, if you're on a committee, be honest. Don't be whiny or defensive. Talk to your department chair or your committee chair. You know, can you take a little longer? Can you have a smaller role? You know, can you, can you help find a replacement? If you are the committee chair, get help from the committee members. Have them help you get back on track. See if there's administrative support you can get. We're all going to have times where this comes up. And just sort of address it honestly as early as you identify it and, and find some solutions. And, and I'll emphasize this, but this is just super great advice. We all say yes to things. It's just our nature. We tend to say yes. We get into something and it's actually not that interesting. It's not going to be that impactful. Or I just don't have time. Just be up front and, and move off so that someone else can maybe step in. The worst thing to do is to be that person who just never showed up. Right? It's much better to just be up front. Gee, I'm really sorry. I, I can't continue on this. Um, we've all been there. We all get it. So, um, like I said, the, the promotion to professor language is very different. I'll send this out to you. Um, in general, you're expected to have a broader, more mature view of your research, scholarship work. And so we asked a bunch of departments if you had to have a big change in your research or scholarship agenda. And the answer was, nope. Um, once again, <coughs> they, they expect a similar or perhaps higher level of scholarly work. Both departments tend to want another book, or those, some of them are going towards more articles. Um, if you're in a, a field where you have a research group, you might be expected to have a higher publication rate because the group's getting established. Um, you know, and your reputation should continue to improve. But once again, you can do the stuff that maybe seem too risky. And um, just as a few examples, engineering had a really emphatic no um, on all of these, and that no, you really can't you know broaden your reputation, become internationally known if you're always switching directions. So. You know, go for more mature or um, deeper questions, higher impact publications. Once again, there may be journals you avoided because they're really risky and it's going to take a long time to find out, but they're higher impact. Now you can take that chance. And Mary Jo Daniel is going to talk about some of the resources we have to help you with this. Thanks, Julia. Sorry. So I know you've been sitting here a long time, so we'll be fairly brief, but we're kind of circling back to you. And so we're going to be talking about your research and scholarship a little bit. And I want you to think, you've been working for the last umpteen years on whatever you've been working on. I want you to think, what about it do you love? Okay? So there's, of course, the best part, which is writing the reports to the agency about what you did and filing all those data. But there's there may be interviews, there may be digging into data, whatever. I want you to stop right now and jot down on a piece of paper three things that you love about research and scholarship, your world of research and scholarship. What's, what are three things you love? Just on a piece of scratch paper. 
I'm all about making things explicit. If you have to write it down, you actually have to put it into a word. You guys can do it too, you know. You can do it electronically, yes. I'm old school, so I said paper. I'm old, so I said paper. I guess I could just say that. We're not looking for a thesis, just a couple of key words to remind you. Because these are the things that no matter what you do going forward, you want to hang on to in some way. Because you love it. So I want you to tell a person next to you what you wrote down. Tell the person, somebody at your table, what you love about research yeah. and scholarship. Oh, no. <laughs> One of the <laughs> almost one of the best things about working in a place like UNM, if you haven't figured it out already, is the incredible breadth and depth of the scholarship that goes on here. So I would guess that many of you found something that you love about scholarship or research that is different than the person you talked to, because everybody's doing different things. But hopefully you all found something because you are at a research institution, so one hopes you actually like doing this stuff. And so keep those in mind. As you're thinking about, you're on your sabbatical, you're dealing with all of those requests to be on committees and to do service, keep in mind <coughs> sort of the central things that make a difference to you. Because you've got all these demands on your time. And you still have to do the whole work-life balance thing. And that always cracks me up because, you know, kind of work and life, they're not really two different things. But the idea is that there is more than what is here on campus, but what is here on campus is part of your life. And you can sometimes get disconnected from what motivated you in the first place. If you were really driven into your field by some interest and pressures for promotion or whatever diverted you a little bit from that, now's your chance to get back to it. And this is what Julia and James and Tina and everybody has been talking about. And so one of the challenges, of course, is to stay engaged. And Ricardo brought up some questions about, you know, the money's gone, the startup package is gone, what do I do now? How do I keep going forward? And so one of these is to keep thinking about what motivates you. And you may have to go back a little bit in terms of what got you into this in the first place. And things may have changed, too. But what matters to you? What, do you? what difference do you want to make in the world based on your research and scholarship? And keep those as sort of frames for what you do next. One of the ways to do this is to think more about the broader impacts or significance of your work. You have impacts in your discipline. You have impacts that others are going to be um, drawing upon. But perhaps now you want to think long term about how your scholarship, how your career is going to make a big difference in the world. And so Tina's, one of her slides said plan for five, but look ahead for 50. This is about the impact of your scholarship too. Do you really care, you know, you've got your, your core research and perhaps now you want to look at how that impacts different communities or different people. What is that long term impact you want to make? And that might be something that keeps you, keeps you energized. As Provost Holloway said, finding other people to work with, making new, uh, finding new opportunities for people with different backgrounds and different experiences than you. This can be something, it's, it's just fun. And it can make you think about your work from a different perspective. Trying to explain what you do to somebody who hasn't been in your world at all is really intriguing, and they can come at it and respond back to you in a way that you never thought about. So there are some concrete ways of doing it. You re-engage with your professional community or you join another one. See what resources there are out there in the professional community. And you look for interdisciplinary problems. Right now, on campus, we have these three grand challenges. I will tell you, as new associate professors, 
this is an incredible opportunity for you to take a leadership role. Having worked with all three of them, there's lots of room for leaders to emerge in this process. They, have, they are figuring out what they want to be and how they want to go about doing it. And so you can look at where, you, where they are but help shape where they might go. And you can take a leadership role. Right now, for the first time maybe ever, the regents have committed resources to a research scholarship enterprise. And so this is a way to, this is a real concrete way that you can, you can engage in interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to try going in a slightly different direction. There are SEED awards, the RAC awards that came up before. Advanced manages the Women in STEM Award. These are specifically, the STEM, Women in STEM Awards are specifically for STEM. And the grand challenge is two out of the three have already done internal competitions, and the third is talking about, and will be as far as I understand, doing an internal competition. Again, to build interdisciplinary collaborations and start some new um, proposal development. And it doesn't have to be just in STEM. I can say the sustainable water resources, they've, they're, they've got somebody and they're looking to have more somebody from fine arts. They've got people looking in humanities, looking in economics, in law, all different sorts of areas, ways they can collaborate on building understanding and moving the state forward in terms of sustainable water resources. And again, you have an idea how those grand challenges might go forward? Put them out there. You can also go big, or bigger, with the work that you've been doing. Maybe now's the time to start working on, if not leading, maybe leading, at least having a leadership role in a large center grant or a large um, interdisciplinary enterprise. There's lots of possibilities. Staying energized doesn't mean you have to do it all on your own. So this is where, you know, rising above the urge to do it alone. Tina mentioned sometimes it's hard to ask for advice. Well, sometimes in my role as a director of research development, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at faculty who don't think they can ask for help on some of the things that we have help, for which we can provide help. So FRDO is a faculty research development office. And if you haven't heard of us, it's a group of us. So most of the colleges have somebody who's dedicated and then if you're in a college that doesn't, there's a core team. And those are all the names of the people. And that's a beautiful picture of all of us that you can't quite see. And what do we do? We do a variety of things. We basically, and I'm using research broadly. We provide support, and I forgot to bring the handout, sorry about that, we can send them to you, um, for your research enterprise or scholarship, we can help help try to locate funding that would be appropriate for what you want to do. We can help with some of the planning and project management. Before this morning, part of the reason I was late was I had one meeting where I was meeting with a potential PI and one of my colleagues from FRDO to try to figure out how we're going to bring people together. We need to have this team going forward to go after this grant. So we were strategizing who do we need and how do we need to bring them together? What kind of structure do we need for a planning meeting? And then after that, I was sitting with one of my colleagues, again, from the network, and a PI and a co-PI, looking at a draft and ripping it apart, quite frankly, and saying, look, you haven't addressed this from the solicitation. You haven't done that. So we can do those kinds of advising and supporting. We don't provide technical um, feedback on the intellectual merit and say, you know what? You're not at the front of your field or whatever. You need your colleagues from your department and your profession to give you that. But in terms of have you communicated clearly, have you met the criteria, that we can provide feedback on. We also can provide the nuts and bolts logistical feedback. How do you build a budget? How do you get all of the bits and pieces you need for these proposals? What is the solicitation actually asking for? What is this? foundation say they want. How can we try to make sure that you're going to be as successful as possible and get funding or get the resources you need to move forward? 
if there is something you need for your research and scholarship and you don't know how to get it or you don't know if it exists, ask. You can push us and say, you know what? We really need this thing. That's how we got graphics support. Faculty said, you know what? I am not very good at designing graphics for my proposals. So we got it. I mean, it's a grad student and he's great and providing that resource. But you have to tell us if we're not doing it. That's our website, frdo.unm.edu. And you can almost see the kinds of things that we do. And we have on there resources and templates. There's a whole page of um, different kinds of funding opportunities. We put out a weekly announcement of new funding opportunities that goes out through the colleges in various ways. It's also posted on our website. There's a database of funding resources that everybody on campus has access to. So there's lots of resources and we're happy to work with you on how to access and use them. So please don't feel like you have to do it on your own. That's what we're there for. And um, it's kind of a use it or lose it because if nobody uses those resources, why would the university continue to fund it? So please do use us. I need a job. <clears throat> Any questions or comments? Jessica. Comments. I love this. And it's been wonderful and helpful and um, very important for grant submissions. And I couldn't have done my last year without it. Thank you. We always like to hear testimonials, too. <laughs> <laughs> I will also, I do also just want to mention. One of the things my office is, is, is responsible for are internal limited competitions. So that's where a sponsor says the university can only submit X number of proposals. And so we put that information out. If you aren't on the PI list serve, you should get on it because that's how we send those notices out. And there's a link on our website as well as on the VPR website. And then if we have a competition, I reach out to faculty and say, would you serve on a committee? And it's not a huge service load, and that you know depends on how many proposals there are. But they're pre-proposals, so they're short. And it does give you a chance to see some of the scholarship that's happening on campus, get to see some of your colleagues' work. And also can help you in thinking about how do you write something that's compelling, that's short. And if you would be interested in being a reviewer on limited competitions, and they come up periodically, I'd ask you just to shoot me an email at FRDO or at me, mjdaniel, at unm.edu, and say, you know, I'm willing to, I'd like to serve on a limited competitions review. This is my area. Because what I do is I try to find people who have relevant expertise but are not thoroughly conflicted which can be a challenge sometimes because some areas are not, there's not that many people. So I just want to put that out there, that that's another way, and then you can count that as service because it is a service to the community. Yes? I actually do have a question. I just got a notification that I got taken off the early PI list. No. <laughs> is there a middle PI list or something where we still um, get that type of information? So Stephanie Tafigi in my office, she created this list of assistant professors and I'm Many of you apparently got bumped off of it because that was, yay team, you got promoted. If you want one, if you think that there's something, um, the thing about early investigators is that there's lots of funding opportunities that are targeted specifically for that. At this point, you've essentially graduated to the PI list um, because there aren't many calls that are specific to only associate professors. Um, so. The simplest thing is to be sure you're on the PI list. If you have, I'm trying to think if there's a, a, a special series of resources that would be most appropriate for new associate professors. Or if there's elements of what Stephanie was sending out to you as assistant professors that you want us to be sure, send an email saying, you know what, it was really helpful when we got this. Yes, Ricardo. Very good. Um, one resource that becomes more and more important or go to me or something that looks professional that doesn't draw conference calls every 45 minutes when you're being from our university and they think that you're a good student. 
<laughs> right now, this is apparently an incredibly unknown thing. Everybody here can get a free Zoom account. Every person at UNM can get a free Zoom account. And you send an email to, I think it's media at unm.edu, and they'll ask for an index, but they're not charging them. And they're saying that at some point we may have to charge you, but right now, everybody can get Zoom. So to just follow up, would it be possible if your office could select an email to use with those resources, like Zoom or something like that? Well, I mean, I know that guy. I have to find Yeah, I, the Zoom thing was a surprise to me, too, because I said, I need one. And they said, well, you can get one. Yeah. It's like, whoa, OK. But yeah, that's one of those, I don't know what the long-term plan is for that. For my, that's an IT thing. But um, you come to a workshop, you get this free information. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we probably could put that on our website somewhere. Is, is it still just the one hour, though, before it's Zoom? Like no. Okay. It's a full regular account. UNM has an enterprise account for Zoom because of classroom uses that, the, that use it. And somehow that means all of us can get accounts. It's like they have thousands of them and they're underutilized. But when all of us get them, probably they'll start charging us. It would be interesting in this. Um, I, I was in pharmaceutical engineering for everybody. Yeah, and there are resources like Grammarly and other things. And if you if you have suggestions or things that you want to do, seriously, send me an email. I will tell you, my office has no money. Okay. Don't ask for money. If you, need, <laughs> if you need something that costs money, we basically go to the VPR and say, look, this is what is being asked for. And then he'll say, well, what's the department doing? <laughs> but you can ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. And then if we hear a lot of demand for something, sometimes we can find the resources. But we don't have any funding. Anything else? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And keep in mind, there is a request help from an FRDO button on their website. So it's, it's really easy. So we're just going to wrap up. Take time for yourself. You've earned it. This, you, you have a lot more control and freedom now. And you know, take advantage of that. And, and you've got an opportunity to try something new. And I want to share some advice. I heard one undergrad offering another, um, when I was walking through the sub one time, that I, I think it's a different way of, of reinforcing Tina's message. She said, don't mull it, prairie dog it. You need to get out there. So. <laughs> Take advantage of having interesting colleagues and a broad range of resources. We skimmed across the surface of a lot of topics. Um, I and Mary Jo and Barbara and others are happy to have one-on-one -on -one meetings to talk about more. If there are topics where you'd really like you know, a 50-minute workshop, let us know. We can do that. Um, if you want a confidential meeting to discuss this, we can do that. I can help with promotion planning, and we'll be doing a promotion planning workshop in the spring. If you're not ready this spring, there'll be another one um, that you can go to when you are ready. Um, please do remember to celebrate and realize there are resources here, and ask any of us if you know you you think there should be something, and you're not sure who to ask, and we'll 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 help you figure it out. So thank you very much.